Welcome, Fly Tribe, and welcome to the Painful Truth Podcast, where we will dive deep into uncomfortable topics that will help us grow as an aerial athlete. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome guys to this week's episode where we dive deep in how I became a professional circus performer and the reality behind the curtain. In today's episode, we are going to go behind the curtains in the circus. And if you haven't already, go ahead and like and subscribe to this channel. Uh, that really helps us to push this podcast out to people just like you. Also, share it to your aerial buddy who may want to hear this also. All right, guys, let's go ahead and dive in deep. All right, let's go behind the curtain. Woo! All right, guys, so most of you guys know that I was in um, the circus. I was a professional aerialist, and it seems like all glitter and sunshine, but I promise it's not. Why do you think they call it a mud show? It wasn't the easiest decision to become a professional circus performer, and back in the day, Google barely existed. So let me take you back a little bit. I had just had a breakup of like two years, and I felt like I was at a crossroads. Living in the mountains of Taos, New Mexico, I decided to sit down and, and weigh my options. I really felt like it was time to kind of move forward with my life. And I wanted to make something of myself and I knew it was that the right timing for that. I loved so many things and it was always so hard for me to stick with one thing. Um, so literally what I did, I sat myself down at the kitchen table and I got a piece of paper and a pen and I drew a scale. I drew a, drew a vertical line and then I wrote, I, I wrote down slashes down it. And I wrote everything that I loved according, you know, I put it on the scale according to how much I loved it. And I wrote down all of these things I loved most and put them on the scale. I began to weigh them out and decide what I would love to do as a career. Everything pointed to fitness, yoga, circus, etc. So I decided on the circus since it seemed like it checked all the boxes. From there I focused on the circus. I even quit skiing and rock climbing as often as I used to. And when I decided that circus was what I wanted to focus on, and it was what I wanted to try and do as my career, I kind of pushed everything off, everything else off to the side, like rock climbing and skiing and all of those extra things that I really loved doing. I just didn't do them as much. I knew I had to dive all in if I was going to make it happen. Because becoming a professional circus performer, like who does that? Okay, it's not easy, first of all. So I did what everybody did back then. I searched for books. So I, I bought a book. I bought all the books that I could find. Okay. All the books on how to become a circus artist. There was one. And I bought that one book. I'm not even sure if Google existed at the time. You could search, but I don't think it was through Google. I forget what it was, but the only thing that showed up was the circus dictionary online, which was super basic at the time. You kids are so lucky to have the internet and all the resources today. I just had to put that out there, but backing up a little bit, my mission at that point became literally when I read that book, the only book at the time about how to become a circus artist, it said that the artist trained like three to eight hours a day. I mean, that's a pretty big wide gap, but still, even thinking of three hours a day was daunting to me. I had no idea how I was going to, to do that. I worked three jobs and I was young and I didn't quite have the know-how to prioritize any of my time, but I did it. I began training at least three hours a day It was intense, 
because I was not used to working three jobs and then having to train between times and at least three hours a day. I had to condition myself for getting up earlier and making more structured routine. This is when I learned and in, 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 I learned in my body how to get up earlier, to get more accomplished. I no longer was this carefree fly by the seat of the pants kind of gal. I had to be regimented and serious. It was tough though, because it took blood, sweat, and tears, literally. I traveled 45 minutes to get to my aerial classes. I went as often as I could, along with training at the gym and at the park. The park is a great resource when you have no other option. Most parks have monkey bars and you can at least do the fundamental conditioning skills. And my friends and I had a performing group called the Flying Desert Brigade. We traveled with our boyfriend's band and we would all perform together. It was really a, a great experience and great time of my life. But along with performing with them, we would perform with the String Cheese Incident and um, at their huge festivals like Vegas and Horning's Hideout, just to name a couple. It was an amazing experience. I'm telling you, like most people don't even know who String Cheese is, but um, you should look them up if you don't and they're amazing, okay? But that's kind of how I got my start to kind of like performing. And it's crazy to think that because those were huge events. <laughs> I guess this is where you could say I got a taste of the pro performing though. Even though we were not professionals at the time, we got to work with some of the best resources in the entertainment business. We got to work at uh, Red Rocks, um, and, and that's, that's huge. Uh, that's just to name one. We got to work at so many amazing places. Hey, Fly Tribe. Okay, Fly Tribe, if you haven't already, go ahead and ring the bell, subscribe, like this episode here. It helps push this in the algorithm to help other people just like you reach this, um, this episode. And other than that, let's go ahead and get to it. But needless to say, I knew I wanted to go further with my circus abilities and it wasn't easy finding how to become a circus artist. Then I finally found the Gemini twins who were mentioned in that book I read. I can't remember the title of that name of, of the book and I, I looked it up on the internet and I could never find it, but I'm gonna find it. I know I still have it. Um, it's just in a box somewhere in storage and I need to dig it out. But the Gemini twins are the founders of NECA, which is the New England Circus Center for the Arts. New England Center for the Circus Arts. <laughs> Either way, um, they were in Cirque. They're also the OGs of the uh, Sultan Banco uh, Trapeze Twin Act. Uh, I saw that they were going, and at, during this time, um, you know, I, I, I don't even know how I s found out that they were going to be at the Aerial Festival in Colorado. I don't know how I found that information. I don't know if it was, if I contacted them or how I found that out. Maybe it was the internet, I'm not really sure. But needless to say, um, I went to the festival and that's kind of where I got to train with them and found out about their program. And that's kind of how I you know, found out about their school and everything. And, um, and then I auditioned for their professional track program and on it was to circus school. Once I found out about their school, I knew this is what I had to do if I wanted to become a pro circus artist. I sent in my audition tape and I got in. I was super ecstatic and nervous at the same time. Like how on earth was I going to move to Vermont from New Mexico? Persistence, that's how. You know that thing I always mention when you want something, you have to create a picture of it in your mind. Uh, this will help you have persistence and willpower. And those things are what's going to help you drive towards your goal. Circus school was tough, especially for those of us who had to work and work to be there. But you do what you gotta do to be there and to make it happen. 
unless that's how it used to be and still is with myself, I also battled a neck injury that I had sustained from doing a one shoulder stand on stilts. A trick I did often to perfection, but the constant on one side, finally destabilizing my neck enough to fall under the weight of the stilts, I did the move perfectly, but the pure weight was just too much for my neck that was unbalanced. It's just another reason why I push in my method for working both sides consistently and working the fundamentals like stabilizing exercises more than you even think to do. The brutalness of circus school was like so worth it though, okay? So going pro, like my first real pro job was at Great Escapes in New York. And that's, I think it's like a Six Flags, like a water park, but Six Flags. I was uh, to fill in for a trapeze artist who unfortunately had broken her nose during um, a dive trust fall. That is where there are two people diving in water together but it takes a technique in order to do it and to do it safely. The show was a dive show where the main acts were high divers and I got to play the part of Ruby the pirate. I did static trapeze. This is where I ripped the crap out of my hands and learned all about palm care from the pro aerialist that I was filling in for. She was awesome and later ended up working with her on a different show after the dive show ended. We became really great friends still to this day, and she's uh, now a retired professional aerialist where her specialty was the iron jaw. She worked in the circus until like after she turned like, she was well beyond her 50s. She's a, a true inspiration for me, and I always looked up to her because I always have this mentality, if they can do it, I can do it. But a definite inspiration and awesome to know a lot of the OGs of the circus industry. And, and she's the reason for that. So I owe it a lot to her. I owe a lot to her. My career um, really took off from there and I really never looked back. Her name is Becky Ostroff. Y'all should look her up. She's awesome and she's a badass. Okay. Going behind the curtain, it can seem all glitter and sunshine. But I promise it's not. It can seem all glitter and sunshine, but I promise it's not. It's showbiz. Okay. We may not get paid like Hollywood, but that's only because we didn't sell our souls to the devil. But behind every curtain, are layers of stories and not all good. They don't call it a mud show for nothing. They call it that because you are usually walking in mud when heading to go do your act. When working in a traditional circus tent, which is what I prefer and which is the only way a circus should be performed in my opinion. And any circus that is not in a circus tent is not a circus. It's just a performance show. Some people may argue with that and that's okay. But the tent is usually set up in a field outside of town. You always hope for grass, but it's usually more dirt. And after the big trucks and campers roll in, well, it can be a disaster. So you have mud shoes and you carry your show shoes to the tent. It's also why you want a robe. You put a robe over your costume while walking to the grand tent. It's also what makes a lot of the magic of the circus. Hey, Flying Tribe, if you haven't already heard about the Aerialist Ultimate Shred, it is an at-home four-week fat loss program just for aerialists like you who would like to feel lighter in the air. All right, this program is four weeks, but you can do it longer for as long as you need to, suggest it up to 12 weeks and then take a break and then you can hit it again. But this program is meant for you to shred fat and feel lighter in the sky. When you feel lighter in the sky, you can also look more graceful, feel more graceful. You can execute your techniques better with more grace. Uh, those micro bins will vanish. 
hello, and your endurance will skyrocket. You can find this program for $97, full access, lifetime access, on our Instagram page at flying.fitnesstx. In the bio, in the link in the bio, or also on, on the YouTube channel under the description of this episode. All right, let's get back to the video. The grit it takes to be a true circus artist, the ability to be super uncomfortable. It takes a strong person to be a circus performer. I will tell you a quick story of when I was working at Ringling Brothers. I was walking through the curtain and I was thrown across the room. My breath was taken from me and I was in a panic for a moment because I, I really didn't know what had hit me. And well, it was an elephant line. <laughs> the first elephant literally kicked me and she was just walking, but as she was walking in stride, her foot kicked me and she didn't even feel me, I bet. <laughs> it's truly something they, they should warn you about. They should warn every new person about when when working with elephants but and working with curtains like that not everyone's used to working with elephants or layers of curtains so um yeah and so these elephants were walking back from practice and i didn't see them i was used to a tinted show not a show in an arena with multiple layers of curtains needless to say i learned to always look and walk away from the curtain. Another not so fun topic to talk about, in fact, it makes me uncomfortable going there right now about it. It just means I need to talk about it. So there was a lot of adultery behind the curtain and a lot of cheating. I witnessed myself being I actually witnessed it myself as well because my boyfriend actually cheated on me right in front of my face and he was like denying it. And then everyone around me like acted normal. It was the most bizarre thing ever. Um, but I also witnessed it with other people and so many other people being played right in front of everyone. It truly is a disgusting part of the circus and quite frankly life because I, it's not just the circus. but. It is something that I saw over and over and time and time again, like it was normal. And it happened to me too. Um, but I'd like to say that it, hopefully it doesn't happen in every circus, every show, okay? But we weren't married, thankfully, when my boyfriend cheated on me, but there were some people that were married that I've, so I witnessed this happen to. For instance, there was a Russian troupe that I worked with once on a show and there was a newly married couple and they had just had a baby and she was so adorable, so precious. And the couple had, had known each other actually all their life. Um, and the girl's father was actually the troop leader and um, I guess maybe the instructor. But either way, the guy was part of this troop and had been for, for many years. Needless to say, this guy, he literally was cheating on her with another dancer. He did it right in front of her face, in front of all of our faces. They had no shame in their game. And here she was, and this girl was freaking beautiful, okay? She was, first of all, she was Russian. And, and she was just freaking beautiful and her baby was so precious, okay? like adorable, so beautiful. And she would walk around with the baby behind the, the you know, behind, um, behind stage and going to practice and doing this and doing that. And here he was like messing around on her. It was just, and he was pretty hot, but it was insane, okay? So I got to see that quite often. I saw this over and over time and time again. It is sad because the circus is supposed to be like about the family. I do believe some shows and circuses don't have this problem because I know, I know one show for sure that is like a true family circus. Like, 
they have a lot of family on their show. Maybe that's why it doesn't happen. But let's hope it doesn't, okay? And um, don't be one of those people. But it's also hard to live the way you want to live when you are in the mercy of a contract. That's another one of the realities behind the curtain. <clears throat> My diet regressed and when I worked for certain shows, um, it was really difficult to eat the way I like to eat. I'm a vegetarian. Well, actually, I don't even like to say I'm a vegetarian. Honestly, I just, I don't eat animals and I eat from the earth. So whatever the heck you want to call that, I just don't want to put a label on it. I really don't. But the inconsistency of being in new places and not having proper ways to cook and store food was, was always really hard for me. It was always hard to like find that routine and that regimen. Being on the road can also be draining on the pockets. It can really drain the cash flow quickly. First of all, you're in a new place, it's exciting, um, and uh, you really have to learn how to prioritize your funds and budget because all you wanna do is go and explore. You also more than likely don't have transportation and have to take taxis, or at this point there's Ubers. When I was touring around, uh, we did not have Uber. If there was, no, no, well, no, at the end of my per performing career, yes, but not at the beginning for sure. But there is now. The accommodations aren't usually the best, but that's why we are used to being in some very uncomfortable situations as aerialists. For instance, when I worked with my friend from Great Escapes, it was awesome. Um, she got me the next touring job in which I stayed with her in her Airstream camper. And talk about cramped, but I was young and I loved it. I don't know how she handled it because she was much older, so God bless her. <laughs> but working for Ringling, I lived on the train. I got to experience both size rooms because um, there were there was a few different size rooms, but I forget what they called it, like a state room maybe? I can't remember, but it was pretty big. And it was when I was an aerialist, I, I got to stay in that room. Um, and, um, and that was awesome. When I was not working there as an aerialist and um, was helping them out in the nursery, before going on to my next job, they moved me into one of the smaller rooms, which was ridiculous, okay? So in the state room or whatever it's called, you can actually put a yoga mat down in it and I could stretch and walk. Um, there was a, a bunk bed, there was two bunk bags. I like, literally had some space, but it wasn't a lot of space, but um, I shared the train car with the conductors and so the bathrooms weren't the, the best, I'll be honest. Um, not because they were train conductors, but just because they were grown men, I was the only female, it was just gross. And um, yeah, but then I had jobs where I lived in the casino and I had access to the, to, you know, the full employee buffet, which was nothing to complain about. Also had full access to the spa, which was amazing. So there are glimpses of glitter. The pay can be great. It can be shit too. It's going to take the industry as a whole to get the pricing right. But when you have people undercutting their price just to hopefully get the gig, you are only destroying the industry. The best thing to do about pay is to get sound advice from an experienced performer. You know what else is behind the curtain though? Jugglers, clowns, and their little cars too. Props for the sword thrower. An aerialist warming up, contortionist upside down, and the ringmaster getting ready to go through the curtain to introduce the show. And not just any show, but the greatest show on earth. The circus is amazing. It's why I founded the Flying Fitness Studio in Amarillo and to literally give other people the same opportunity I had to find magic. The opportunity to be myself and find my authenticity.
I feel like circus really enabled me to do that. And that's why I really advocate for being yourself and allowing other people to be themselves. Everyone deserves that same feeling of experiencing the circus, whether if you're performing or whether you're watching. All right, Fly Tribe, if you enjoyed this week's episode of how I became a professional circus performer and the reality behind the curtain, share this, share this episode with your aerial buddy and don't forget to tag us on Instagram at flying.fitnesstx to win some fun aerial swag. I will definitely personally send you some swag for shouting us out. And do me a favor, guys, and help us reach more people just like you. Um, give this video a like on YouTube and go ahead, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. You can even ring that bell to get the newest videos I drop. May you create the life you have always wanted. See you soon, Flight Tribe.